For anyone that may not be familiar with our group, we are Penn Science Policy and Diplomacy Group, or PSPDG. Our group's mission is to help early career scientists develop skills and gain real world experience in science policy. Ooh. Um, okay, sorry, someone requested live transcription. Okay, all right. Um, and gain real world uh, experience in science policy, science diplomacy, and science communication. And today's workshop is part of our science policy programming. Uh, today's workshop is also the first in our Memos to Meetings programming series, which will be followed by our Memo Teams kickoff in April, a workshop on how to meet with legislators in June and opportunities to speak with legislators over the summer. Following this workshop, if you decide to join one of our memo teams, you may either uh, choose to submit your memo for publication in a journal or to this year's NSPN science policy writing competition. This is the first, fourth time that the National Science Policy Network has hosted it and PSPDG has had teams place first or second in all of the previous three years of competitions. Um, and all that's needed is submission of a two page brief um, on a policy a topic of your choice and you'll have the chance to win prize money in addition to publication of your work. During today's workshop, we'll do our best to answer these questions. Why should scientists write policy memos? How do you even go about writing one? How can you find a good topic for a policy memo? And we'll get into what we mean by good later. And how do you evaluate policy recommendations to find those that might be the most actionable and effective in addressing the issue that you're hoping to draw attention to? We will have breakout room activities to help you get comfortable with the skills you'll need to create policy memos. And we'll also cover some practical tips for formatting and displaying data in your memos. Uh, your teammates in your breakout rooms today will be PhD students, med students, a few undergrads, and professionals. They are primarily affiliates of Penn, Jefferson, Temple, and Drexel, and we're also lucky to have a few that heard about this event through our mailing list or a friend. When you registered for this event, we asked you to provide a list of your general interests for memo writing, and you'll be working with a team grouped by those shared interests today. Um, so now I'll hand things off to Karen so we can start the workshop. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen, and in this section of the workshop, I would like to start by motivating the reason behind writing memos and why scientists should write memos. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start with a hypothetical uh, case. Let's imagine that you are a scientist who is in general concerned with the environment. Uh, you're not an environmental scientist, but you know that there is a lot of research out there on climate change, pollution, um, the uh, ecosystems. And uh, you would like for this research to make it to the hands of policymakers who will then be able to uh, make bills and take actionable steps to promote um, societal action. So is there anything that you as a scientist and a politically active citizen can do to promote this type of action and, this type, uh, and, and solutions to these problems? Well, yeah, one of the things that uh, you can do, for instance, is write a policy memo or a brief. Now, uh, the environment is a very broad issue and it would be really hard to just to write one document on all the different angles uh, that, and facets of this, of this topic. So you decide to mostly just focus on water. Uh, next slide, please. So within water, there are still many possible angles that you can, uh, uh, that you can talk about in your, po in your policy memo. Uh, you decide to mostly, mostly just talk about access and infrastructure. And you also remember that um, very recently you went hiking to West Virginia and there you heard about water access issues from the local population. So you decide to make that the topic of your policy memo. Um, after doing some research, you, uh, you learn that representative David McKinley um, has uh, in the past shown support for environmental issues and for issues related to infrastructure. So um, you decided that, that you're going to address your policy memo to him and to his staffers. Um, and after doing some more research, you, uh, you find uh, information like this, like the fact that 44% of West Virginia streams are polluted. Um, and you come up with two, with two main recommendations. 
One, expand funding for existing programs that are already helping local communities maintain the water systems and their wastewater uh, systems. And you also uh, recommend that the government provide for the government to provide economic incentives to, commu to those communities uh, so that they can adopt innovative water technologies. So you put all of these into a memo and this is what it's going to look like. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is page, this will be page one of two of your policy memo. As we can see, it's a very succinct document. Uh, your audience is time constrained. Your, the representative McKinley and his staffers won't have time to go over a lengthy report on this issue that was just brought up to them. Uh, this memo, this, this document also contains recommendations up front at the very, uh, um, in the very first page uh, and, and very clearly, uh, and it follows a very uh, uh, well-defined structure because policymakers uh, are already used to reading these types of documents and need to know where to find the information that they need very easily. It's also, uh, the, it all, this document also doesn't include any technical jargon because after all, Representative McKinley and his staffers are not experts on water pollution and water management and access. Uh, so, but it still contains the relevant information that they would need to make to, um, to, uh, to follow up and make policies around this issue. And as I mentioned before, it, it makes clear policy recommendations or it could also give different policy options along with their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it is not just a literature review on, uh, on water pollution. So, um, uh, so in that sense, it's, very, it's a bit different from uh, from the, the papers that we're used to in the sciences. Uh, next slide, please. So I would like us to compare uh, that document, the policy brief that I just showed to this. Um, this is an extra, an excerpt from a journal that talks about a similar issue. It talks about a water pollution uh, due to natural gas extraction in the Marcellus Shale. Um, so in a, in a paper like this, that's uh, published in a scientific journal, you would find uh, paragraphs that read like this. Uh, an analysis method paragraph, for instance, with, for instance, with a lot of that goes into a lot of detail on the technical on um, on the analysis methods. Uh, so it is uh, these types of papers are very technical and inaccessible in general, and are buried in academic research and in academic journals. Uh, next slide, please. So only towards the end of these types of papers, uh, or like in this type of paper, in this paper actually, the authors just conclude that additional steps should be taken to reduce the risk of pollution. But uh, first of all, a policymaker is very unlikely to get their hands on a, on, a, on a paper like this. And even if they were able to read it and take the time to parse it, it's also unlikely that they would be able to just come up with um, actionable steps that can be drafted into a bill um, into a bill right after reading a, a, a paper like this. And even if they were experts on that topic, um, they would probably not be experts on all the different areas uh, that um, bills in Congress cover. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, anything from energy to transportation, health, water, civil rights, labor, labor rights, uh, the criminal justice system. So this is where policy memos come in. Uh, next slide, please. They, they serve, the policy memos with their policy options and recommendations serve as a bridge between uh, the, the existing research that from academia with uh, the empirical evidence, the data, and on the other hand, um, the policy decisions and the law that contain the actionable steps that can be taken to solve a given issue. Next slide, please. So this, um, the, in this context, the, the example that I just went through um, illustrates why scientists should and can write policy memos. On one hand, policymakers need uh, evidence-based recommendations. And on the other hand, uh, scientists already have the skills to find sound evidence around, uh, around a, given, uh, a given topic. They, we have critical thinking skills, knowledge of data analysis, ability to evaluate methodologies. Um, on one hand, policymakers need uh, an ample understanding of specific topics. 
And scientists already have the um, the experience and the knowledge of acquiring uh, the, the experience of acquiring a lot of no uh, knowledge on complex topics very quickly. Um, uh, also, policymakers uh, need uh, succinct and easy to digest information. And um, in, res uh, in response to that, scientists already have the skills to translate and communicate complex topics to a non-expert audience. So we see that this is, there is uh, very much a synergy between the skills that scientists have and the needs that there are in policy making, in policy making and the, the writing of policy memos. Uh, next slide, please. So where do policy memos come in in the entire legislative process? Uh, so this is a chart that illustrates the lifetime of a bill. Uh, it, uh, it shows the different stages that a bill goes through from the time that it is drafted up until it is signed by the president and it's executed uh, by the, it, it, it's carried out by this executive branch. Um, so next slide, please. Policy memos pretty much come in at every stage. Uh, from the moment that the bill is drafted, for instance, a policy memo or brief can be the document to uh, bring attention to a topic. And uh, then a, a, a staffer representative might um, begin uh, working the recommendations into a draft that will eventually become a bill. Um, or they could also come in uh, when, the, when committees are writing reports, uh, debating, debating the, dr the drafts, making adjustments to the bill that will eventually be signed or passed. And even, and police memos might even come after the, the bill is signed. Uh, for example, next, next slide, please. Um, in 2016, uh, the Delaware River Basin Restoration Program was created. This is a program to, uh, to protect ecological diversity, improve water, uh, water quality and access in the region, um, prevent flood damage and uh, expand access to uh, water for recreational purposes. Um, just very recently this month, Representative Dwight Evans uh, for Pennsylvania uh, is um, trying to pass a bi uh, bipartisan bill to, to expand this program beyond um, beyond 2000 to 20, uh, 2022. So we see that, uh, and it's very likely that policy memos and, di and different policy documents went into informing the, informing the creation, the, the creation and the different, um, um, and, and informing the creation of this program. So now I'll pass it on to uh, John, who will talk about more about the, um, the structure of a policy memo and how to write it. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Karen. So uh, yeah, so we're going to kind of go into more into how to write a policy memo, like what it is, what the structure of it is, and kind of what the main goals are. Um, so next slide, please. Great. So basically, a quick overview of what a policy memo is. It should be a relatively easy document for policymakers to read. As we know, they're probably pretty busy and they don't have a ton of time to sit down and read a lot of policy memos. So what you want yours to do is basically allow them to quickly get a sense of your issue and your recommendations and possible solutions um, in that short amount of time they have to read it as it hits their desk. And essentially, you want to address these three main questions in your policy memos. So there's what's happening, what's working, and what should be done next. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just like an example structure of a policy memo. This is pretty basic. It, um, it could be like a starter template for you. Um, you would start with the title, and then next is a little executive summary. Um, and then the bulk of your real policy memo would be that background and evidence section. And then you could end it with a section on policy options and action. Um, next slide, please. So kind of going more in depth into each of the sections, um, the title itself should be clear and the straight to the point gives them a great idea of what it's gonna be about as soon as it hits their desk and they lay eyes on it. Um, next slide, please. You said executive summary, or it's kind of like a summary of that, the main points of your um, memo. It's the brief overview of the issue and solution. And you really wanna make sure that this section is free of any jargon so that they can get through it quickly and know exactly what you're trying to say. Uh, next section. Yeah. Um, like I said, the background evidence is going to be like the bulk of your memo. And this is where, especially for the background, you can make that really audience specific and really show them why 
um, this issue matters to them and why they should care about um, any solutions you propose. And then um, this is where else you can include any data or figures to back up your points. Um, next one, please. And then this final um, policy options and action section, um, this is where you can lay out those clear cut action items for policymakers and um, give them multiple alternative options. So you're not really cheerleading for one um, main solution. Uh, it shows that they have multiple ways of going about it. And also you can include a conclusion in these sections, just kind of restate the main issue um, and kind of show why it's important and why it should be solved. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so back to these questions I brought up at first. Um, so what is happening? Um, basically what about this, you wanna describe maybe the issue and its current and future impacts, show, uh, convey why it's important, why it's an urgent issue that needs to be solved. Um, and then what is working? Uh, this really evaluates the policy landscape affecting the issue. And um, by answering this question, uh, you could provide evidence and analysis that support your findings. Um, and then going into what you should do, uh, what should be done next. Uh, by an to answer this question, this is where you would lay out uh, different policy options that could address the issue um, and basically highlight action items for policymakers to uh, pursue and make it um, really clear cut and easy for them to see um, how these specific action items can help this issue. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so now if looking at those main questions, um, this is a little diagram showing, you know, where you might answer these questions in your policy memo. Um, it doesn't have to be in the same place for every memo, um, but this is kind of just where a majority of them might be. So, but what is happening? Um, you could address that in both your main, um, main point or executive summary, and then the background sections. Like I said, again, it'd be very audience specific in that background, show what's happening, um, maybe some current and future impacts that could, um, occur if this goes unsolved. And then moving towards the what is working question, this could be shown in your evidence um, where you can include data and figures and stuff like that to show what's um, currently working in the policy landscape. Um, and then finishing up with the what should be done next question, that can go in that conclusion section, which could also be a part of your policy, op policy options and um, action section. Uh, so next slide, please. So now these are just some quick variations on the structure of a policy memo itself. So different documents, policy memos can range from something like a brief one sheeter to a really thorough 60 page document. Um, so there's no set um, structure of a policy memo, but most commonly they're about two to six pages, which depends on the depth of analysis needed for your memo. And there's also different purposes of science policy memos in particular. Um, so we have one here, education. Uh, this one basically aims to educate a policymaker on an issue without making those policy recommendations as opposed to advocacy, um, which would be alerting that policymaker to an issue. And like I said before, laying out an actionable list of policy of uh, possible policy interventions. So th that would be kind of an educational versus ad advocational. Uh, next slide, please. And then going off that again, um, short memos uh, might tap typically be presented to policymakers in a more designed fashion, maybe with more graphics for just like an ease of reading. Um, and then the longer memos that you might see are typically more thorough and can all um, tend to be text. Um, certain publications and competitions will favor better design, um, which we'll get into a little bit more later. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, so here's just two quick examples of what I was talking about um, earlier in this slide. So the memo on the left is one of those longer, more thorough memos, memos and you can see it's all text. Um, and then the one on the right is a shorter one that utilizes different um, graphical designs. So you can see there's an actual graph. Um, there's a clear attention grabbing title. There's some color contrast with the blue and they have a little blue box that separates different sections and shows um, and really draws your eye to that one box. Um, so there's that really long wide range that you could be on. Um, next slide, please. So here are just some um, additional resources that could be helpful to you if you plan on uh, going about writing or structuring a policy memo or brief. Um, so the International Development Research Center has a great page on how to write a policy brief. Um, also the National Science Policy Network, um, which will be referred to as NSPN, um, and the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, or JSPG, are two really great resources um, for how to write a policy memo. And um, if you're looking for examples of some, um, also, someone else that has all these is PSPDG. Um, we have a great website with a, a lot of different resources that could help you in writing and structuring your policy memo. Uh, next slide, please. 
All right, so now we're going to get into our first group activity uh, topic. There. Cool. Thanks, John. Um, yeah. So yeah, now we're going to talk about how you can sort of go from a broad issue area that you're interested in uh, and sort of turn that into a policy memo. And this is going to consist of four steps in general. Uh, so the first one is going to be choosing uh, a good sort of specific policy memo problem. Uh, the second one is going to be giving you, you some resources uh, for doing topic specific research. Uh, the third is going to be once you have a problem in mind, how do you actually come up with a recommendation or different policy actions for that? Uh, and the fourth one is going to be targeting uh, your memo. So picking like a specific target audience that you have in mind. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the first thing we're going to talk about is how do you come up with a good problem to discuss in your memo? Uh, next slide. Um, so when you're thinking about what to actually write a memo about, uh, there are really four things you should be keeping in mind for what like a good science policy problem is. And the first thing is it should be timely. Uh, and that means it has to be sort of an, an issue in the world right now, um, because if it's not really having impacts right now, it's going to be hard to get a policymaker or other people in your audience to really care about it. Uh, the second one is this, this problem has to be uh, easily defined and measured. Uh, you wanna have some metric that you can basically point to and say, okay, this is like how I know this is a problem right now. And later on, this is how you know that you've actually solved it. Uh, the third criteria is sort of, you want a problem that can be solved with policy. Uh, otherwise, again, it doesn't really make for a good policy brief. Um, and the fourth one is, especially for science policy, uh, you want a problem that has been studied in the literature pretty extensively. So in your memo, you can sort of point to the science and say, okay, this is like backed up in the research. And that's a really great way to sort of convince people uh, of, your, of your problem. Next slide. So yeah, starting from a broad issue area. Um, so a lot of the times your research is probably not going to be directly applicable to policy, um, but you still might have this sort of broad issue area uh, of, of interest. Uh, so for me specifically, uh, a couple of colleagues and I wrote a policy memo a couple of years back about voting machines, uh, which is not at all related to my area of research, which, which is like this really niche subfield of, of robotics, which really doesn't lend itself to, uh, to policy memos, unfortunately. Um, and the takeaway from that is that you don't really have to be an expert in the problem that you end up choosing to write about. Uh, your sort of training as a scientist will still be really helpful in analyzing problems and like writing a good policy memo. Next slide, please. So yeah, this is sort of uh, how you should think about starting out from a broad issue area like climate change or, or AI um, or gerrymandering or, or any number of topics that really aren't unfortunately like specific enough to write a policy memo about. Uh, this is how you can sort of approach narrowing that down. So let's say you're interested in writing about cybersecurity. Um, Again, a really broad topic that really doesn't lend itself to a, to a policy memo. It's sort of hard to summarize all the problems in cybersecurity in like four pages. Um, so you might start with an initial search, like something like cybersecurity vulnerabilities in the United States, something super broad. Uh, and this will lead you to resources like the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, the Department of Homeland Security and other resources like that. And you might find that two sort of sub areas of this are, are infrastructure, and industrial or, or corporate sort of private sector networks. Um, unfortunately, those are still not really specific enough to write a policy memo about. So you continue narrowing it down. So in infrastructure, if you look into the different components of infrastructure, you'll find like transportation, uh, the power grid, uh, things like election security. There's a lot more, uh, but sort of you can narrow it down to what strikes your interest. Uh, and if you look into sort of private sector, industrial corporate, you'll find that information sharing uh, is sort of a really um, important avenue to solving those problems. So you can add that as another subcomponent of interest. And then let's say out of all the components you've mapped out so far, you're most interested in like transportation and election security. So even within transportation, if you look into it a little bit more, you'll see that there are cybersecurity components to like our aviation infrastructure, our rail infrastructure, um, and like buses and cars and things like that. Um, and in election security, for example, two main components, uh, one that's really come up in the past couple of years has been misinformation, uh, and another one is, is voting machines. Uh, and once you're sort of at this level, you can that's 
really where you've gotten specific enough for all policy memos. So in the field of voting machines in particular, uh, you can talk about like ballot marking devices, direct recording electronic devices, all the cybersecurity vulnerabilities in those. Uh, you can propose amendments to like the Help America Vote Act and stuff like that. And those are really like where you've gotten specific enough for a memo. Next slide, please. So if you're doing like an initial search uh, to help narrow down your topic, uh, you'll find that a lot of the initial research you do won't make it into your memo or your brief, but it's still important for you to sort of understand the, con the broader context to your problem. So going forward with this voting machines example, uh, if you do a really broad Google search, like which states use handmarked paper ballots, you'll come across a couple of different types of resources. So next, please. Uh, the first main source you'll come across that's really useful are, are news articles. So here we have some results from like the Washington Post and the Arizona Mirror. Uh, and these are going to be really great because they will give you sort of current events surrounding your interest area. And if you think back to like what makes a good memo problem, being timely is sort of a really important component. Um, so news articles will sort of really help you narrow down because they'll show you what's going on in this like interest or issue area right now. And if we go next, we'll see that another important uh, sort of source are advocacy organizations. Uh, so here we have results from like the Election Defense Coalition, Verified Voting, and the Brennan Center, all of which are advocacy organizations with like very specific policy platforms of things they advocate for. And so these can also be really useful for you because you can see what are these organizations advocating for. Um, and you can try to incorporate their sort of policy platforms into your memo if you're interested in that. Or you can maybe see, is there a niche that advocacy organizations aren't covering uh, in their policy platforms and maybe write a memo about that. And lastly, uh, something that'll be really valuable are like governmental or policy sources. Um, so here we have like results from the National Conference of State Legislatures and one from the like Oklahoma state government. And these will be really valuable for you because they'll show you what the policy landscape looks like right now. Um, and sort of, again, you can look at what is missing uh, right now? What are previous bills that have been proposed around this issue uh, that have maybe not gone, uh, not gone past uh, and things like that. So that'll also be really helpful for you. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so now we're going to go into our second breakout room activity uh, where you guys are going to start from this broad interest area that you've uh, put on your registration uh, and fill out an issue breakdown for it, similar to the chart I showed before. Um, and yeah, uh, at the end of this, I'm going to ask a couple of rooms to like share the results. So just keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, now we can go back into the breakout rooms. Um, great. Uh, as Hirsch mentioned, my name is Stacy, and I'm going to give you a couple of additional sources to think about once you've narrowed down your, your topic um, more from that broader category. So take, for example, you were at first interested in child health, and at the end of the day, you've narrowed it down to lead poisoning um, in school systems. So um, next slide, please. The first place you might want to look for this topic is academic databases. As Karen mentioned, this is something we do well already. Um, you're probably familiar with how to navigate um, databases. And so if we looked in Google Scholar and PubMed, which would be a great source for this specific issue. Um, you can go ahead and press the next slide. Um, you would get two papers on um, childhood lead poisoning, both of which talk about different sources of exposure. Um, next slide. Another great place to start um, are newspapers. If your topic is geographically um, oriented, you might want to look at local newspapers. They can give you a really good sense of how the topic has been covered and the people who might care about it in that setting. Um, but world news can also be helpful, um, especially when you're sort of introducing the scope of the problem. Um, so next slide. So here um, for, for lead poisoning in kids, we um, have an expose from the Philadelphia Inquirer um, that's looking at Pennsylvania children in particular. Um, and then sort of big, broad picture understanding of global childhood exposure to lead. Um, next slide. So think tanks are, are great sources of information, but do keep in mind that they tend to be a little more left leading. And so depending on the audience, which we'll talk about next, um, it's helpful to just kind of keep tabs on that. Um, so um, KFF uh, health affairs are both more health leaning 
think tanks, um, Brookings and Rand tend to have more economic um, information and then Mathematica and the Urban Institute are a little more um, like social, um, social and social justice oriented. Um, so putting in sort of childhood lead poisoning into some of the um, searches on these websites, um, all of which are sort of freely available, their materials, um, we get the following um, titles. Um, so the social cost of lead poisoning and health affairs, um, the Urban Institute looked at um, sort of long-term benefits of preventing childhood lead exposure. And in that specifically, they look at screening in school systems. Can move on to the next slide. Advocacy organizations can also provide a lot of helpful information. Um, specifically, if there is a professional organization that covers your topic in, in particular. So in this case, the American Academy of Pediatrics could be a really helpful source of information. They release a number of policy statements, um, including one about lead poisoning, which I'll show in just a second. Um, and the ACLU also covered a a similar topic. Um, the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center tend to be a little bit more um, law focused as their name suggests. Um, so you can go ahead and press the next slide. Um, yep, so the AAP released a um, prevention of childhood lead toxicity policy statement from their Council of Environmental Health. Um, and the ACLU looked at this in New Jersey um, specifically. Can move on to the next slide. You may also consider university associated centers. So I kept this specific to the Philadelphia region. Um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, for example, has um, a research center that's focused on policy. Penn has a center for health incentives. Um, and then I put law reviews in here, depending on your topic, they may not be um, as relevant, but can frequently have a lot of really helpful information um, especially if your topic has something to do like with like specific legislation. Um, so next slide. These are some examples from these sources. So um, Policy Lab at CHOP has a um, piece about sort of more directed to parents about protecting children from lead poisoning. Um, and this law review covers um, constitution and civil rights on lead paint. Um, next slide. So yeah, I hope those are helpful recommendations. There are, of course, a lot of different places where you can look for sources, um, but these that I, I covered can give you a good starting point once you have a more specific topic. Um, so I am going to um, kick it over to the team for coming up with a recommendation. Thanks, Stacey. So next, we'll discuss how to come up with a recommendation. Next slide, please. So before you take a deep dive of your research idea, there are two steps you need to do in advance. First, I want you to pause, think, and ask questions. As John introduced before, there are three key questions. The first one is, what is happening? Can I quantify it? The second one is, what is working? And the third one is, what should be done next? So, so those three questions can serve as guidance for your in-depth research later on. Next slide, please. And second, as Hirsch suggested, scanning the landscape is important, which can maximize our research efficiency. So there are two pro tips. So the first one is try to find a recommendation that has been extensively anal analyzed in the literature. The second one is to look to other cities, states, and countries for solutions, especially those that have been studied in depth. Second, uh, next slide, please. Okay, now let's look at an example. So now we have an idea. The idea is to reduce pesticide use to minimize negative results to human and environmental health. So how should we start to ask the questions? Next slide, please. So remember, the first question is what is happening? So we need to be quantifiable and be specific. So here we're asking how much pesticide is being used? Next, please. And the second one is what is working? And we want to ask what efforts have been undertaken to reduce pesticide usage and how effective are they? Next, please. So the last one is what should be done next? And we're interested to know what policy options could be implemented to reduce the amount of pesticide being used. So after finish the asking questions, we can start to do the research and come up with different possible options. So how do we evaluate and assess multiple options 
and decide which one to use as our final recommendations. Next one, please. So there are two common criteria to evaluate the feasibility of your policy recommendation, the SWOT and PASS analysis. With this, uh, we can build our feasibility charts to look at the op option systematically and come up with the final recommendations. Remember, the brief doesn't have to have a recommendation. It can also be an educational brief. And uh, we, we included some uh, examples of educational brief in the reference package will be shared later. So for the SWOT analysis, most of you probably be familiar with it already. It was adapted from the traditional business analysis. It looks at both internal factors, strengths and weakness, as well as external factors, opportunities and threats. So for this workshop, we're not going into the details of SWOT, but additional information will be provided in the reference package after the meeting. Next, please. So now what is PASS? So PASS stands for political, economic, social, and technology. So unlike, unlike SWOT, uh, this strategy is more directly aimed at the external microenvironmental factors that might be affecting the position. So both SWOT and PASS analysis have the positive and negatives. So the question isn't much a matter of fact, like which type of analysis is best for your purpose, but rather than how you use analysis and put, it, put its discoveries into the practice. So uh, next. So now we're going to look a little bit more in depth on what is a PASS and how do we build a feasibility chart using the PASS analysis. So PASS gives you a starting point to carefully an analyze the feasibility of all your recommendation options from different angles. So one important thing to note is that there might be times when all or few of your recommendations might not be entirely feasible, especially as a scientist. For example, the lockdown was implemented to overcome COVID spread, a spread when it certainly wasn't the most feasible option, but scientists still recommended it because they knew it would be the most effective and be the best to the public health. So it is okay to share recommendations that might not be the most feasible, yet you think are important. So you can build your own feasibility chart by measuring options in the context, context of past categories and through the perspectives of the key interest group. And we're going to kind of give the examples from those two angles in the next few slides. So the more detailed you know, your knowledge of your subjective, the more authoritative the outcome of the chart. Now let's continue the pesticides idea we discussed before. Next, please. So first, uh, let's look at the criteria. Here we're putting the criteria into six categories under the four major umbrellas. So we have political and administrative visibility under the political, and then we have, uh, we have like the uh, environmental impact under the social, and we have the development progress of eco-friendly pesticides under the technological. So you may also fold the social feasibility into the political feasibility and equity tests. So the, this four umbra umbrella is not kind of like that constraint. They are more used as a guidance to help you break down different criteria and to help you to evaluate, evaluate your recommendations. Next, please. So similarly, we are breaking uh, the stakeholders under those four umbrellas. And as you can see here, the some stakeholders can be under both economic and social factors. So in this chart, in this chart we're going to show in the next few slides, we're going to prioritize a, a hypothet uh, the hypothetical solutions to the problems of pesticide use among farmers. So farmers will be our priority. Uh, next, please. So after, after, after we did the research, we came up with five possible options. So technically there are four possible uh, policy options because the first one is always do nothing and that is whole uh, uh, solution. And then the second one is a tax pesticide and third, fourth and fifth, they are related to kind of like uh, if we should increase or limit the number of the pesticide and if we should discourage the pesticides, uh, pesticides through the tax breaks. Next please. So now we're come to the actual building uh, the feasibility chart by using the past analysis. So just to recap, our idea is to find a solution to the problem of underregulated and overused pesticides. And here, due to the time uh, constraint, we're not going to go through the whole chart. So this is not an exhaustive chart, but only for illustrative purpose only. 
So on the uh, the bottom row, it shows five criteria as we mentioned before, and the first column shows like the top uh, the the first three options we just introduced, and the uh, plus and the minus sign means we have like the either the positive and negative outcomes uh, based on your recommendations. And as you can see here, the only the taxing uh, pesticide meets the bar of being administratively feasible and if, uh, equitable to all parties. It has a positive environmental impact and it has both, it is both cost effective and offers a positive economic impact. So for this memo, uh, we are gonna prioritize the tax pesticides and include that as a recommendation in our main memo. And you can also talk uh, a little bit more about the tax pesticide, both from the positive and negative outcomes in your main body. Next please. So similarly, uh, here is a feasibility chart, but we're looking at the stakeholders we mentioned before. So the, the bottom row is of the criteria, we have the six stakeholders. So as you can see here, similarly, the tax pesticide still dominant uh, among all different options. And, and as I mentioned before, the, uh, the farmer is the one kind of like uh, the priority of the, of the chart. So that is also be used to as uh, as as a benchmark to evaluate which one is the dominant of the of the options we we choose. And uh, next, please. So to wrap up, uh, here are some pro tips on how to maximize your effectiveness and and also just don't let the politics influence your solutions too much. But here are some things to keep uh, in the back of your mind. So first is timing. If you are asking, asking for funding, it is critical. You can look at if this is a Congress in session or election season or post-election season. Second is the past records. Has there already been a vote on your bill? If so, what's the results and what can we learn from it? The third one is the bipartisan cooperation. So basically frame your recommendation in a way that appears to all parties. So with that, uh, that will be the end of the recommendations. And uh, before we go to the next section, next please. Before we go to the next section, uh, let's go back to the breakout room and work on the past analysis together. Uh, cool, so yeah, now we're going to talk about how you can find a target audience for your memo. Uh, I know there was a question about this uh, earlier in the chat, so hopefully this can at least give a short answer to that. Next slide, please. Um, so the first step is to sort of understand who's going to be reading your memo. Uh, a lot of advocacy memos will be addressed like Congress should, uh, or the EPA should do something, or the Pennsylvania state legislature should do something. Um, but in general, uh, memos are going to have a little bit more targeted actions. Um, and so it can help to sort of have a more specific target in mind. Um, and the reason it's, a, it's important to understand who you want to reach uh, is because it'll really help tailor your content. Uh, for advocacy memos, it can help structure your arguments for what like will be the most effective towards the people you want to do something. And for educational memos, you can sort of think about what knowledge might these people be lacking and how can this memo sort of help fill the gaps in their knowledge. And this also make your memos more effective if you want to take them to legislators. Next slide, please. Uh, so going back to this like civics 101 slide, right? Uh, you really got to think about who has the power to influence the process related to your memo. Um, and depending on what you're asking people to do in your memo, uh, you're going to have different targets. So in the first two stages of a bill, you're going to be targeting like representatives or senators. Uh, if you're asking them to like take a bill out of committee or modify a bill in committee, uh, you're going to be targeting specific representatives in committees. Uh, once the bill goes back to a floor vote, you're going to be like telling or asking representatives to vote for the bill. Uh, and then once it gets to the stage where it's passed Congress, uh, you're going to be targeting the executive branch, so like asking the president or the governor to sign a bill or, or changing how an executive agency carries out this law. Next slide, please. Uh, so just going a little bit more in depth into committees and caucuses, this is in general uh, where most bills die in the legislature. Uh, so this is probably going to be the most helpful for, for targeting your memo. Um, so committees are official groups of legislators who handle a specific legislative area, and they actually have official power. Uh, once a bill is introduced, it sort of goes into committee, and whether or not the bill actually gets passed depends on if the members of that committee uh, you know, vote for the bill to make it out. Uh, and these will handle areas like agriculture, 
uh, science, space, and technology, ways and means, which uh, controls like taxes and things like that. Uh, and I think there are 15 committees uh, or something like that in the house. Um, and they all handle you know, different areas. And then the second part, uh, the second type of group that can be helpful to target are our caucuses. Uh, and these are groups of legislators with shared legislative goals. Uh, they don't have any official power, but they're sort of meeting with each other to sort of work towards some common goal. And these will typically be made up of like a bipartisan uh, sort of membership of, of representatives or senators. So there are a bunch of different caucuses uh, and these will be like way more specific than committees. So you'll have like the Congressional Bike Caucus, uh, the Senate Taiwan Caucus, the caucus on like California high-speed rail. Uh, and you can find pretty much one for like anything anyone could care about. Um, so in our additional resources uh, uh, packet, uh, we're gonna be giving you yeah, some of these links uh, that will sort of help you choosing who to target. I'm not gonna go over all of them for time reasons, uh, but we'll be sending you these later on. Uh, and with that, uh, back to Stacy for some practical tips. So rounding out the workshop today, just some things to keep in mind as you're starting to put pen to paper um, and working on your memo. Um, next slide. So we sprinkled some writing tips throughout the workshop, but just to reinforce some of what we've talked about, um, the executive summary is really important. It's kind of like a scientific abstract. The first thing people read um, should be tight, concise, um, and stand on its own, um, while also avoiding some of those like acronyms or more um, specific language that would be hard to understand without reading the entire memo. Um, titles should be short, descriptive. Um, they may also be a strategy for using space wise wisely, so you can um, sort of break up some of the text and it's easier on your reader. Um, they also help you organize um, your points and they should stand alone as an outline for your memo. Depending on the format that you're working with, you may choose to highlight some key points. You can do that by using bullets and numbers, um, italics are sort of bolded words. It may also be appropriate to pull out an exemplary quote and make that in larger text or use vignettes for a population that's most affected by the issue that you're writing about. And then finally on language, it's important to be as specific as possible while making your sentences sort of crisp um, and short because every word counts. Use active voice and, and again, we've, we've talked a lot about this, you're writing for non-experts and so make sure that your language is reflective of that. Um, and then finally, we're gonna talk about some graphs. Um, so you can move on to the next slide. You may or may not be including a graph, but um, they can often really help you with real estate in your, your memo. Graphs explain a lot more than they sort of would if you were trying to write that up in text. Um, so these are just some best practices for evaluating graphs um, and choosing if you wanna include them in your memo. Next slide. So titles and labels, really important, right? Um, on the left here, we have a bad graph. Um, the y-axis has like a break in it, so it's not continuous. Um, the title is really hard to read. The graph is inverted, which makes the labels kind of hard to figure out. Whereas on the right, it's much better graph. Um, things are very clearly labeled across the axis. The title is really sort of obvious and represents the content well. And then we have a pulled out sort of quote of what the authors feel is most relevant for the reader to take away. Next slide. Um, be careful with colors and, subset and data subsets. So here on the left, um, we have not a great graph. Um, they've divided up their bars into a bunch of different colors. It's not easy to make out what those really mean or what they contribute to the overall picture. Um, and their colors are also kind of hard to look at altogether. Versus on um, the right, it's clear that we're talking about Indonesia because it's a different color than the rest of the bars. Um, and they've divided world coffee consumption really intuitively based on country. Um, and last slide. Um, so this is about using space, um, especially with sort of geographically contextualized issues. It could be possibly like really helpful to include a map. Um, so here on the right, we have the city of Richmond and they're looking at tree cover in relationship to previously um, redlined neighborhoods. Um, so this is a really effective way of displaying information. Whereas on the left, we have 
sort of percentages put into a Venn diagram, which is just not a great way of using space. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind if you're deciding to include um, visuals in your memo. Um, and I'm going to kick it back to Lindsay to um, close us for the day. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was great to uh, get to know so many people that are interested in possibly communicating with policymakers on research. If you'd like to stay in touch with uh, PSPDG to learn more about our programming, um, you can join our listserv or join our Slack here. Or if you just have questions about this session or um, any of our programming, you can reach out to us by email at pen.science.policy at gmail.com. Um, and here we include the link again for joining our uh, memos uh, teams, which will kick off in April. You can join a team to write a memo to submit for publication in a journal or to this year's competition. And um, you don't necessarily have to move on to presenting it to a policymaker, but you can certainly hang on to do that um, in, in May and June. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we're going to hang out for a minute in case anyone has um, some questions about today's workshop or about our memos to meetings uh, programming. So thank you so much, everyone.